Anybody else want to join the panel? There are a lot of chairs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and that was indeed, I think, an extraordinary speech by the mayor. I think it put a lot of things into perspective. But we have a wonderful panel here to build on that and to use the mayor's speech as a starting point for how we think about smart cities, how we integrate technology and the correct technology to deal with the challenge. I am Llewellyn King. I'm a journalist. I have been a journalist for quite some time. I've been covering energy issues since 1969. And it about five years ago, I first heard here in, here in Texas about smart cities, and then I got a great education from Morgan O'Brien, who seems to have thought about everything a bit before I have thought about it, um, which I, I suppose is, not, <coughs> is quite inevitable. We have a super panel here, and I'm going to ask them simply to say hello and give their names and why they're here, so we can be as expeditious as possible. I will then ask some questions, and we hope this very collegiate panel will enlighten everyone and quite possibly have a little fun. Uh, Mike, would you like to begin? Sure. Uh, Mike Sturm, City of San Marcos, um, Director of IT. Alexia Santo, VP of Business Development from ClearWorld. Uh, Trey Mendez, I'm the Mayor of Brownsville, Texas. John Sullivan, I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at Lit Communities. Ramzi Saad, I'm the CIO of City of Round Rock. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I think we might begin with you to get your response to, oh, sorry, Rebecca, I didn't see you down there. Uh, I was hiding. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rebecca Davio. I am a professor, uh, an associate professor of practice at Texas State University and the director of the Institute for Government Innovation there. I, I don't know if it means anything, but Rebecca is the only member of the panel I actually know. <laughs> <laughs> so one, why I've overlooked her, I... You met me in the hallway fought, you know, 30 minutes ago, so... I this is like, not New okay. York, this is Texas. <laughs> <laughs> um, the mayor, Mr. Mayor, would you, we're honored to have you, it's a great pleasure. And uh, I wonder if you would like to comment on some of what I thought was an extraordinary speech by your fellow mayor, the mayor of Austin. Sure. I mean, um, I'm always happy to follow Steve. I think Steve really sets the bar uh, for innovation when it comes to mayors, uh, not just in Texas, but really across the country. And I've known Steve for a while. I consider him a friend. And I think a lot of what's happening in Austin uh, is really kind of a guide for us, not only with what's working, but also what's not working. Uh, and um, just, I'm really just uh, honored to, to know Steve the way I do, and, and I think that they've really, like I said, just led the way on innovation, and I think what's happening here uh, takes a little bit of time for the other cities to see and adopt. Uh, as far as smart cities, the city of Brownsville uh, certainly looks to Austin as a guide, and currently we are undertaking a lot of smart city initiatives. For those of you that don't know, uh, the city of Brownsville was uh, in 20. 19, I'm sorry, 2018 and 2019, uh, the city of Brownsville was considered the least connected community in the United States. Uh, I was elected in July of 2019, and it was uh, at the very top of my priority list to cross us off of that list. So uh, with the help of, of several community partners, we put together a group of several stakeholder entities, including the Brownsville Public Utilities Board. We do have a representative here today, uh, Mr. Eddie Hernandez, and uh, really just just uh, set the goal of eliminating the digital divide and nowhere was that more evident than Brownsville. Uh, we had uh, valedictorians in our city that were going to McDonald's to use the internet or knocking on their neighbor's doors and that simply just wasn't something that was acceptable to us. Uh, so uh, thankfully we started this prior to COVID, uh, got some good partners, uh, lit communities, you'll probably hear some of that later, but uh, now we, we entered into a public-private partnership with them to the tune of about $90 million, 90 plus miles of fiber infrastructure in the city of Brownsville. And uh, we're gonna go from one of the least connected to a model partnership for the rest of the country. So uh, really proud of that. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to ask Mike, who thinks he's known me for eons. 
uh, this is a very fast-moving city. Uh, <laughs> um, to, to explain what he means by smart city, one of the things that I've found in the five years or so that I've been writing about smart cities is that the definition changes and that everybody's expectation is different. And the assessments of how smart a city is, you get very tired of that very quickly because it depends on the criteria. Some include public transportation, that puts London and New York and Boston right at the top. Uh, if you look at other things, there is a city here in Texas that has decided public transportation will be ride-sharing, and there won't be buses and trains. So that uh, this thing is very fluid. Mike, how do you see it? No, I agree. I think, um, you know, what I see, you know, somebody says they're a smart city. I think it's a, a progressive city. They're, they have their eyes open looking at how they can um, provide services to to all generations that live in that city. It's not about one generation anymore. It's about providing services across the, across the board and making sure that, you know, I'm gonna say this a political word right now, it's equity, um, that, that, that smart city is, is, is provided to, all, to, to everybody. You're not focusing in one area, you're focusing in, in providing that level of service. Um, city of San Marcos got into um, smart cities about 2008 with um, smart metering. Um, which, um, which we had a, uh, as um, Mayor Adler, Adler, Adler said, you know, you had a, we had to solve a challenge, and the challenge was how does we, how do we provide information to our citizens about water usage, and electrical usage. So that was a challenge we solved with smart metering. But it's ever changing. It's a big investment. So that's what I'm gonna have to say with that, sir. Rebecca, I'd like to ask you as an, as somebody who's not operational in a city, but looking at the issue, what do you think are the key things that make a city smart, and how fluid and flexible are the criteria? Well, I think fluid and flexible might be part of the criteria, but focused. And um, I think that um, really providing services, uh, Mike said providing services to all, but it's about focusing on the residents of that community and thinking about their needs and what they need and how the city can provide them and stop thinking of ourselves. And I can say this, I feel like without being disparaging as a longtime government employee to stop being a government entity, you know, to really think about what can be provided and how to do that, and less about all the rules and the regulations. John Sullivan, uh, uh, I wonder if you would uh, speak to the question, which I think was implicit, if not explicit, in the mayor's earlier uh, speech, that technology companies tend to tell cities what the city needs, not to find out what the city needs. Um, do you, have you seen that? Is that, in fact, part of the dynamic? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's anybody who works for a government entity knows that there's no uh, shortage of technology providers or integrators telling you exactly what you need or what type of shiny object they want to hang from your infrastructure. Um, so I, I, I do absolutely agree that the important thing is, is to have something that's needs-based, um, something that is focused on a need of the community because I think where, um, because smart cities are pro progressive, right? Uh, they're, they're always, they're, they're, you're never going to be there, right? So our definition of a smart city, there'll always be some, something new, whether it's a new technology, whether it's a new ecosystem like Web3. Um, they're, they're just going to keep continuing, continuously growing. But if you really want to get into it, having those needs uh, either stated or drawn out by the community itself or through those partners who are coming to your community and want to hang that shiny object from your pole, I think it, it's, it's really important that this is something that um, is a priority for the residents, the businesses, the community, but I think most importantly that, um, that it's something that can have success and help build momentum because if that momentum fails because you tried to hang some fancy sensor that really didn't have much of a need, it's gonna have a, you're gonna have a hard time proving to your residents and businesses that it's something that's worth pursuing in the long run.
Thank you. Uh, Alexia Santo, you deal with uh, not only American cities, but cities around the globe. What are the commonalities in that uh, vendor city or interface? One of the commonalities is obviously going to be broadband and access to information. Um, we have some areas that I'm working in where entire communities have no access, um, no power. So really being able to provide a foundation of power for all of our cities, whether they're here in the U.S. or abroad, um, laying that foundation and centralized power source for technologies as they're going to continue to grow. Thank you very much. Mike, I'd like to ask you, are cities equipped to deal with large companies selling them technology. Uh, uh, there's sometimes an asymmetry, I would imagine, between, say, a small or reasonably sized city and, for argument's sake, Google. Uh, there's a disproportionate, probably, weight in the legal departments and also a disproportionate weight in money and expectation. No, I think you hit it on the head. The, there's, there's different you know, if, if you're a big business or looking for, you know, businesses in, are in the um, money for profit. If you're not looking for profit first, you're not going to look at small cities versus medium-sized cities because they can't get the return on investment fast enough. So there is a disproportionate in, in selling technology to smaller cities so in mid, mid, mid cities, yes. Ramsey Saad, uh, uh, do you, what do you find? What is the experience at Round Rock? Um, well, when it comes to scale, you know, I, I always say that uh, communities the size of Round Rock and similar cities that are represented here are a wonderful area for piloting uh, smart city type technology. Um, you know, when you get into large cities, moving something uh, along is going to take a little bit longer. There's a lot more. Uh, you know, things to go through, whereas I think in Round Rock, we try to be as agile and innovative as possible and are very open to taking that risk. I think in, in particular, when you're getting into smart city technology, you have to, you have to try something and some of them are going to hit and some of them are not necessarily going to, but you have to go through that process. Uh, Ramsey, maybe you could tell us the size of Round Rock. So currently we're uh, a little over 100,000. Uh, our expected build out is 250,000 in population. And if you ask our mayor, uh, we think we're going to go vertical. He, he expects us to go vertical, essentially. And that's actually already starting to happen. So I think even the, the number 250,000 is probably very conservative. Uh, I'd, like to, <coughs> I'd like to ask, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, beg your pardon. Uh, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mayor Mendez, what are your Almost everything operates on a critical path. Otherwise, nothing gets done. What are your critical path issues in Brownsville? I mean, there's a lot. Uh, there's so many. First, more than anything, we really want to make sure this broadband project gets going, um, all the infrastructure gets laid. And uh, I know that when we first rolled it out, we were talking different timelines. And uh, there was one year on there, and I scratched out that year, and I put an earlier year. I said, the, the later years is not going to work. Uh, we need to do it earlier because we needed it yesterday and, and COVID showed us just how valuable connectivity was, especially for a city like ours. Uh, we had 70% chronic illness, so people were sitting ducks for COVID and, and not being able to get that connectivity was a huge, huge issue for us. We've solved that issue, at least conceptually. Uh, we have the funding for it. We put up $20 million of city money, uh, $70 million in private, private money, uh, but uh, that certainly is, is the biggest priority. Another thing for us as well is uh, getting AMI online for the city. The city of Brownsville is one of the 7% of the cities in Texas that does not have AMI. So we're behind the curve on that. We're working on that as well. Uh, I'm a board member of our utility company, and uh, we did make a commitment, 20 plus million dollar commitment to do that. So we're breaking ground on that as well. So those two are certainly uh, huge, huge issues for us. Uh, also, just managing growth. Uh, Brownsville is the home of uh, the Boca Chica launch facility for SpaceX. So that has really been something that's grown our trajectory as a city. Uh, they have 1,600 employees. They had over an $800 million economic impact in the region for us this past year. So we're growing, meeting some of the demands of housing, like Mayor Adler spoke of earlier, is something we can relate to. Trying to get enough houses online for us and make them affordable is uh, certainly something that's critical for me, and we're trying to solve that. 
uh, as well. I don't think anybody has a secret formula for that, but we're certainly trying uh, to uh, make as many city projects as possible geared towards affordable housing, not displacing people if possible, but also trying to manage that growth and understanding that, that that's going to come with growth that we're experiencing. Thank you. Uh, while you have the microphone, Mayor, I wonder if you could tell us for situational awareness the size of Brownsville. Uh, sure. Uh, Brownsville is right at a little bit under 200,000. Uh, as of the last census, we were a top 20 largest city in the state. We were 16th largest. I think now we're 18th uh, largest, so we lost a couple spots there. But we're still uh, right at about 200,000. Uh, I think just like most other cities in the state, I think we were grossly undercounted the last census. Uh, we went from 186 to 190, which is totally not even possible. Uh, so we're right at about, I'd just like to say we're right at about 200. Well, I should address the same question to Mike Sturm, especially as uh, San Marcos is the home base of uh, Digital 360. Yes, um, we're about, uh, if you include the university, um, let's exclude them first. So they have a population of about 35,000 that attend Texas State. So that's a you know, daytime population, nighttime a little less. But citizens that live there is probably close to, oh, probably 35,000. So, so, and so it's fairly small. Yes. But an edge city to 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 uh, where we are. Yes. To Austin. Um, <clears throat> Lexi, how do you sell? Tell us exactly what you're selling around the world, and how do you sell it? I mean, if you're sitting, uh, I know you live in New Orleans. Yes. If you're sitting in New Orleans. How do you persuade someone in Scotland to buy your new? <laughs> better, wiser, smarter product? Well, first of all, everyone needs lights, right? So but how, we, how can we make the city smarter? We make them more efficient. So usually I'll have it when I have a conversation with the city first, it's what are your challenges? Because there's not one clear solution for everyone, but what we're providing is redundant, resilient battery storage. Um, at the edge for all of your IoT technologies, connectivity, and your lighting. So I'm not selling a light, I'm selling a battery source to support all the technologies that we don't even know are around the corner. A lot of times when speaking also with, with mayors, it's, you know, what you're trying to see the whole staircase of my smart city vision. It's not a 30 year out um, plan, it's more of a five year. So what, can, what is the first step that we take? And that is laying that resilient foundation of power. Uh, Rebecca, a smart city is not just necessarily more of the same, but more of what is appropriate at the time. And there's some very exciting technologies, like one of which I've heard of is taking the lights from passing cars and using that light, saving that resource, uh, things like that. Um, what have you heard of which you think uh, belongs in the future of cities, Rebecca? Wow, uh, there's, there's so many opportunities. If that's, and, if that's, that's a bit of a stumbler, uh, 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 say something else, or let's see if anybody else on the panel. Yeah, what, I'm what, here to learn from my fellow panel members what's out there that I'm missing and don't know about. Um, thank you. One of the things that you run into if you write about uh, smart cities is you get a lot of correspondence back. That's what happens. I'm a syndicated columnist and I do a television program. And for all of the talk about technology and cities, most of the, the questions I get are what about walkability and coupled with that safety? So how do you, uh, Mr. Mayor, how do you guarantee walkability in Brownsville? It doesn't seemingly cost anything, but I suspect the safety and the lighting does cost well, walkability really, I think, is a planning issue. Uh, there's all sorts of books that have been written throughout the years about how smaller cities and smaller blocks really uh, are a big part of walkability. But I think walkability comes with destinations. What do you want to be walkable? Do you want it to be a, a certain entertainment area? Do you want it to be a downtown? Brownsville, specifically, we're trying to make our downtown more walkable. We're the second most uh, historic city in the state. We're investing a lot into our historic downtown. Elon Musk actually recently gave us $10 million to try and rehabilitate our downtown because he realizes that it's something that'll help him attract employees and address what he calls the significant, significant other problem, which is having trouble hiring younger people that are coming from California, trying to get them to move to Brownsville, Texas. 
it is a challenge. Uh, launching rockets, changing humanity, you know, that's easy, right? In theory, uh, for him, compared to trying to get people to move to Brownsville, Texas. So um, when you're doing that, you have to really look at what is the destination? How do I manage parking? How do I manage the space that I have? I see it more as a planning issue, but for us, Right now, the focus on walkability, and uh, we have a lot of quality of life initiatives. We have a, a trail program that's won awards throughout the, the country. So we're managing quality of life through our trail system that's interconnected throughout the city. But as far as walkability, right now, we're, we're uh, really trying to focus on our downtown. The connectivity that is the hallmark of the smart city does tend to raise, and it certainly raised wherever I talk about smart cities, the question of privacy and it was privacy which basically sank the uh, attempt to put a smart city zone into Toronto, and similarly in San Diego. I'm more familiar with the Toronto experience. Uh, how do you all feel about, just jump in and say, how do you feel about privacy? Uh, and will it be impaired by smart cities? Will people know if you're going to a certain apartment every night? Will uh, I mean, all of the smart, all of the privacy issues um, are very close to the surface when you come to talking about smart cities or any technology that is intrinsically surveillance technology or has the capacity for surveillance. Uh, as you know, the probably the most, the country with the most public surveillance is Britain. Uh, somebody said to me recently, that uh, you couldn't see a British TV show <laughs> if it weren't for CCTV. Uh, and they simply wouldn't know how to make them anymore. The, the first thing when they've taken the blood samples is they look for the CCTV. But that, that has made Britain a lot less private in that you can be seen and observed. What are the general feelings? Lexi, what's your general feeling about smart cities and privacy? Well, we do know with blockchain that open data is what cities are leveraging. Um, and we also know that decentralized tech can, um, can secure our cities um, open platforms better. So at Clear World, we work with the cities and the platforms that they are utilizing for their smart infrastructure, and we integrate it with ours. So for us, it's really just a battery source, and we know that having this decentralized power source will also help with the security issue as well. Mike Stern in San Marcos, uh, how do you deal with privacy? And what are, the, what are the issues, what are the aspects of the city you would most like to see tackled? Is it better, faster police service? Uh, is it uh, surveilling the water system? Uh, what is your number one priority, smart city-wise, in San Marcos? Well, I think it's, it's, you know, what we have related to smart cities and all that kind of stuff, it's, it's really um, uh, personal information you have to protect. Um, all that data that's stored in, in your databases and system are, are, are um, at risk of being um, attacked by, um, by hackers and malicious people out there. Um, so that's really the, the most important thing for, for the city of San Marcos is, is protecting public data and making sure that it's, it's safe and secure and it's, it's not a published on the um, internet and, and all that kind of stuff. So. Isn't personal movement also a concern? Anybody else? Yeah, I think a lot of this stuff is being determined, right? So I, I think that we're going to see major overhauls as far as the way that people look at data, right? And there's a lot of scrutiny right now around big tech companies um, where, you know, residents around the country have, you know, demanded government intervention. Um, I've, I was especially interested in seeing a lot of the federal funds that are coming out, the limitations on the ability to put them into, you know, you could buy cameras, but not cameras that can detect license plates or, you know, so I think that this is something that's in the, the sort of the public conscious, consciousness right now. Um, I do think um, that blockchain and technologies or ecosystems like Web3 were you have the ability to sort of opt out or control what, um, how your data is being used because uh, we might want our data to be private, but in some sense we, you know, for the most part a lot of us like the convenience of how our data is being used. We like to be served up advertisements or, if, you know, if I'm walking 
by a cafe to get a notification that there's a special going on. I mean, these, I think it, it just can't be a blanket giving away our data. And I think these are uh, issues that are going to be like really seriously be looked at over the next decade as a lot of these technologies uh, go in. And I think a lot of it's so that we don't turn out like Britain, because I think there is a lot of scrutiny from where we stand um, that we don't want a camera around every corner to, to be able to monitor us and hold us accountable for things that we thought we were doing in private. So, I, I don't want to seem like I'm hammering the privacy issue too much, but to the public it is hugely important, uh, much less so to those involved, uh, which is always the case, probably. So I wanted to ask uh, uh, Rebecca, how do you see the privacy issue, and how do you, how do you uh, explain to people that the benefits of having a smart city probably outweigh the losses? in uh, anonymity. Yeah, it's a really hard issue. When I was at the Department of Public Safety in the Driver License Division, I used to say, I don't have anything to hide. You know, I'm an open book, go look. And now I have to admit that sometimes I get creeped out by those ads that know exactly where I am and offered me the special. <laughs> but that didn't stop me from going in and taking advantage of the special that I was just offered. So it's a really hard thing, and I think that um, John is probably right, that you know it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's not we can't share any data. It's not we have to give up all of our data. We really have to make those decisions and look at the value proposition that comes from sharing our data. Thank you. Uh, there is a new interest, Mike, in public-private partnerships. Uh, it was a fairly current idea some time ago, and it tended not really to go too far beyond some roadways and airports. Now it is uh, in, the, in the lexicon for almost everything. Uh, how do you feel about uh, public-private partnerships, and are you engaging in them? Um, the city of Samarca is in, engaged in several private partnerships, and it, just depending on the um, the solution that we're looking for. You know, we engaged with um, several of our facilities that are private partners. Um, and um, so basically they provide the funding and we reimburse it because uh, we didn't have uh, the capacity to fund the whole debt. So I think there's places for, for them. Um, and then there's just places that, that it doesn't work for, for local governments. So Can you give us some examples? Um, the one that, uh, that we just um, um, invested in was a public, public services complex. Um, basically, they built um, several large buildings and, and the um, private partner funded the, the fun, funds up front. And, and basically, our utilities will pay it back over a 30-year note. So that's the latest one. So, Thank you. Um, Trey, you've explained to us how, how swiftly Brownsville is, is going ahead, et cetera. Uh, are you use, using public-private partnerships? Or, and because you have a, a, an Elon Musk facility, how does that affect? And is that a public-private partnership? Well, I think swift is a relative term. I think we're moving so swift because we're trying to catch up. You know, we feel like we're a couple decades behind other cities. But um, our, the best example of public-private partnership, I've mentioned that, is our um, broadband uh, initiative through, with uh, lit communities where we partner to create BTX fiber. Um, as far as SpaceX, that's not really any sort of public-private partnership. Um, we don't benefit directly when it comes to taxes or property taxes. Uh, they're slightly outside of our jurisdiction uh, when it comes to the taxing jurisdiction, but we certainly receive all sorts of indirect economic benefits. Like I mentioned earlier, they had an $800 million impact in, in our region, uh, specifically creating 1,600 jobs. I believe 71% of those 1,600 jobs are local. Uh, from people that are within our community, which I think is huge. Uh, certainly, uh, there's a lack of engineers in our community, so he has to import some of those. But it's been a, a great, great impact. I still feel like it's a partnership, though not in the traditional sense. We didn't sign any documents saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to be partners in this. But it's certainly uh, something that we do feel that um, we can contribute, and, and SpaceX certainly contributes uh, greatly to that. Lexi, do you engage in public private partnerships, uh, you being the private part, and um, does that work in every country you're active in? 
Um, yes, we are engaged in multiple public-private partnerships. It's probably my favorite part of my job. Um, as an example, we're working in the city, of, well, in the county of Miami-Dade County, the first large-scale smart city project. It's about $221 million, but the city actually gans, stands to gain 5% up to $100 million. So that's the interesting part to me is seeing how the private sector and the public, and the public sector can come together to bring extra additional revenue to their city to invest in, you know, municipal, scaling municipal projects or in community programs, um, and so yes. And can I inquire, do you put in new poles and new lights, or do you utilize existing infrastructure? So both. Um, Clearworld provides a retrofit and a new system. Um, so we can be retrofitted around ex any kind of existing poles, straight, tapered, wooden. We do utility poles. Um, and so in Miami-Dade, it is going to be about 5,000 new poles and 21,000 retrofits where we'll be going in down all of their streets to create broadband and a smart corridor with CCTV um, and traffic cameras and the like. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mike, what is the impact of the move to smart city -dom? on your educational system. Is that getting smart too? Um, on the educational system? Yeah. And besides broadband, is there any impact as you in the in the smart city, better school buses, better delivery of kids, that kind of thing? Uh, I think um, the need is the need is there. Um, it's a partnership that probably we have. I know. I think we have a partnership. I know we have a partnership with Texas State to um, for their uh, their bus systems and that kind of stuff. So there's broadband on those bus systems um, for the students to continue their education during transportation. Um, I'm not sure of any initiative right now going on with the um, the school district uh, with um, besides um, some um, additional technology being delivered through um, a Fed grant for for continued education at home. And John Sullivan, what do you see as the impact of the smart city move on education? Oh, huge. Uh, when you're talking about uh, situational awareness, uh, active shooter situations, I think uh, as schools tie into the larger uh, public safety, I also think uh, bringing telemedicine into um, schools as well um, to either augment or uh, in some cases replace um, nursing staff, I, I think there's huge opportunities um, in, in even with the telehealth as far as like wellness checks for um, teachers, whether that's mental health or um, physical health. I, I, there, there's a lot of opportunity within the schools and I also think it's the, the thing about education is it's sort of the one area where um, we don't mind there being over monitoring. Um, you know, the children, especially when you get the, you know, in the, in the uh, primary schools, um, you know, children are sort of the, they're the future, right? They are the most important assets, and so I think, you know, as a parent to five children myself, that's you know, and and a bit of a conspiracy theorist, right? I don't like uh, all, all the monitoring, um, but I'll tell you, when it comes to over monitoring my kids in their school, that's one place that I don't mind, and I think that there's a lot of um, parents who feel the same way. Um, can I modify my answer? Yeah, absolutely. Please sorry, go sorry. ahead. I jump just in. And anybody else want to jump in? Raise a hand. Jump sorry. in. Sorry when he started talking about school and safety. And, you know, everybody's, you know, forefront is Uvalde and all that kind of stuff. And um, one of the things that we did with the school district was we, we have a fiber optic cable between us and the school district to, to be able to ha gain access to their video security camera during a active shooter event or active crisis or something like that. So. It only gets used during those events. We don't do any monitoring or anything like that, but um, that provides us uh, inside what's going on in those schools during during event and being able to to detect where those um, intruders are and, and making sure people are safe as fast as possible. So that's been in place a few years. Um, they practice it on a regular basis. So that I would I would add that to it. So thanks. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Rebecca. Um, uh, what do you, what aspect of the city? do you think people should be most curious about as it smartens? They're the obvious things that we see, lighting, maybe traffic lights, but is it the flow of uh, information to emergency responders, or is it things we don't see, like the flow of sewage, the flow of water, emergency preparedness? Um, 
how do you see those changing and how critical is the smart city concept to those services? Can I come back to that? Oh, I want to just do a shameless plug for Cedar and say, you yeah, know, go it's, ahead, it's plug, plug away, plug away. This is a Cedar sponsored outfit. <laughs> Well, one of the reasons that I think this is such an amazing uh, event and idea, the partnership, the mayor talked about it, well, all the mayors are talking about partnerships, and it's like our students need the opportunity to learn in this real world environment, that partnerships with industry and partnerships with municipalities provide to them, and I think that that's just an incredible opportunity that um, is going to be life-changing for them and for all of us because of what they're learning. And so um, that was my, my shameless plug for Cedar um, uh. <laughs> and for Texas State. But I think as a resident of a city that, you know, all the cutting edge stuff, using the lights to, you know, from my car to generate or to, to create electricity and power and that kind of thing, it's very exciting. But you know what? I want good services that are operated efficiently. I do want to have my, my sewage treated efficiently, my garbage collected efficiently and processed efficiently. And I want to know that that the water lines, that we aren't losing more water to waste and to leakage than we are to actual use. And if the smartness can help with that, then that is an incredible benefit to us all. It doesn't quite get the shiny, ooh, wow, new, novel, cutting edge attention, but it's part of what I really want from my government. Um, it, let's continue on the same subject. Um, uh, Ramsey, what do you see about uh, the quiet revolution that smart cities brings about rather than the very public one? The quiet, the quiet, quiet revolution. revolution versus the public one. It's not flat. Sorry, did you, oh. uh, let me repeat the question. I, if I think I can, I understand uh, now, sorry, the quiet revolution. Well, I think Rebecca, said some things that really resonate with me as far as how we operate in a city and how we're trying to deliver services. And that's, yes, we would love to bring all the shiny things that, that really kind of are eye-catching, but we have so many challenges that can be addressed and still we haven't gotten to yet. Um, you know, in AMI, uh, Mayor, you mentioned that Brownsville is still trying to get there. You feel like you're behind the curve on that. That was a huge deal for us, and I think that's a, a serious value add to our residents, but it's iterative because we brought smart technology not only internally to our operation, but um, to the residents to provide them more data, to provide them APIs, to be, to be able to kind of excite them about uh, looking into that. But we had problems with payment processing with that flashy technology, and that's not okay, right? right. Um, first, you have to charge people correctly for the water consumption and sewage uh, waste. So we're making a change right now. Um, we're not giving up on being smart in that regard. We're going to continue to iterate until we get it right, uh, for an example. Anybody else? If, if I can chime in really quick, that's one of the beauties, I guess, of being the 7% that's not there yet, is we get to see all the stuff that works with everybody else. So we're late to the party, but we actually get to see uh, the benefit, or we get the benefit of, of seeing what works, and maybe some of the issues you've had, like payment processing, for example. But if I can also, um, Llewellyn, uh, I think the beauty of public-private partnerships is that it allows a municipality or a city to bring certain services that it may not have otherwise been able to do with public resources in a, in a much quicker. For example, broadband. There's no way we would have ever done that if we had had to focus on our own uh, resources. We would have never done it. So, and because the private sector was not willing to invest in a community like Brownsville, because it wasn't a business model for them. But uh, we're seeing it in other ways too. I mean, development, development of, of housing, for example, what I spoke about earlier, affordable housing and other housing units, bringing that online is going to happen in Brownsville also through public-private partnerships. And uh, that is a way I see it as bureaucracy moves too slow and the private industry is much, much faster. And the example I use all the time is just SpaceX versus NASA. Look how quickly SpaceX can move 
look how quickly uh, they can raise money, capital, as opposed to NASA. NASA is going to take decades to raise certain amounts of money or, or innovate as quickly as SpaceX can. Just because it, it's a private company, it can move a lot faster. Thank you. Lexi, who do you find is the go-to person in cities? Uh, I've heard that in small cities it's fairly easy. The mayor and maybe the chief information officer uh, are in charge of the smart city operation. When the cities get bigger, you get interdepartmental rivalries and uh, turf fights and all of those things, which uh, I'm sure don't happen in any of the cities we have represented here, but which uh, are indeed endemic to larger cities outside of Texas. Well, that's a, a tiered question, or a complicated question. It just depends really on um, where we are in our relationship. So for Clear World, everything is relationship driven. Um, a lot of times when my first dealings with a city, it will be the public works, right? And I'll get into the parks and let them touch it, see it, feel it, um, see all the value that it will bring to their community. Um, and then they start thinking about different application uses for it. So whether that is connectivity in, uh, we work with developers as well. Um, usually we just get a foothold into a city and then the city manager or the mayor will reach out to ask and we'll set up a meeting to go over the extensive list of solutions. So it's never a cookie cutter approach. It's always where can we make the impact first? Let's get the community engaged and off to the races from there. Uh, Rebecca, you're a uh, former government person. Uh, uh, how do you deal, how do you see the, the re reception inside a large organization of what is it? It's essentially an external idea, smart city. Uh, it can be internalized, but initially it, an external idea. How, how to handle that? Well, my sense is the, the uh, um, technology geniuses among us could tell me that, could, could yay or nay on this, but my sense is it's a very mixed bag. That, you, you know, you're looking for somebody to give you an opportunity to have dialogue and to realize the value of partnerships. You know, um, we realize that it's like, in the organizations I've been with, I've realized very, very quickly, I couldn't have all the answers. You know, I didn't. And it wasn't possible for me to do things by myself, and so I needed to build a team. And, you know, that's what I meant earlier. I wasn't trying to insult any of the municipalities by saying, stop being a government agency. But sometimes there's so much um, red tape and precaution and that's there that we really just can't even have dialogue with people. It's like, we want to help, we want to find solutions, and it's like, how do we have that dialogue to find out and understand exactly what your challenge is? and how we can help solve that challenge. Because as um, um, the mayor said, you know, you can't do it all. You've got to have, everybody brings something to the table. And I think that not every government employee realizes that, but there are some out there, as we have evidence here. Thank you, I think that's a very complete answer, but I. I'd like to hear John Sullivan on the same subject. Uh, yeah, I think what, what she said is really important. It really takes both sides because you a lot of times have the same hesitance from the other side. You know, I spent a, a long time in uh, autonomous vehicle mapping before I really got into broadband. And I know that um, hesitance, I actually met with the transportation authority here in, uh, in Austin. and their biggest concern at the time was nobody wants to share everything, right? They, they, every, like every private company that comes to us, everything has to be kept secret. Um, we, can't, we can't share anything with anybody, and so that's just a non-starter for us. And so I think that is the beauty of the private-public partnership is um, it really gives you an opportunity up front to sort of lay out your cards and say, this is what we'll provide, this is what you'll provide. Um, you can work these things out in basic conversations, which essentially turns into a term sheet, and you know what you're responsible for. And the ability to say, I will share this information, which um, if it's just, you know, for, from where I sit, you know, in, in broadband, you know, a, a typical 
person who's a typical com company that's going to come in and offer broadband services, the extent that they may work with the community is we've applied for a permit in your right of way, right? And the, everyone's going to, you know, information is power. And so they'll limit their information that they're providing to the community because it's, cons you know, it's either it's proprietary or it's considered their leverage or, you know, they might not want to let it all out there. And I think the, it's really, really important to have that information sharing. And um, when you have those partners at the table in a private-public partnership, it's what makes it work. It's what makes this new model. And I think this is why you're going to see more and more of it because this is how we're going to fill the gaps for broadband needs as well as sort of build the future of infrastructure because all the players are at the table finally talking. <laughs> I think what you just said about a new model is very, very significant and important. Anybody want to add to that? Well, I'll, add, I'll add a little bit to one of the challenges sure. in talking about the new model, and I think it's agreed because, every, you know, if, I'm going to go back to, to, to city government. Everybody, you know, we're all in the situation of, of housing just skyrocketing, the value of housing skyrocketing and tax rates. And all that kind of stuff. So all the all local governments are cutting taxes in some way or another. So the general funds are getting hit. So there's not a lot of general fund money to invest in smart fund technology or smart technology. So the private partners bringing, like in like you said in Brownsville, bringing in equity, we're matching it to a to small small amount. And that's the way, like you said, the new model is going to have to work. And there's going to have to be equity, you know, venture capitalists or whatever you want to call them, invest in, in local government and trust that, that there's going to be a tax base moving forward to, to, to gain and make a return on investment. Does that create a political problem in the, in the whole area of public-private where populists will run against the company and accuse the, the political entity or the governing entity of giving away the store and... Um, that kind of thing, do you, do you hear that? Well, I'll happily address that. I'll tell you the way that we approach private-public partnerships, which I think is really important, is you know, where a lot of these are, hey, you, you give us, you put a part of it, and then we'll put a part of it, you know, like in the case of Brownsville, and the way that we you know, operate around the country is, you invest the money in your infrastructure. The, the only benefit that we're getting from the funds that Brownsville is putting in is access to infrastructure that they're going to build and own. And I think that's really where the game changer is, is that they can point their finger all they want, but we're not taking that infrastructure. The, Brownsville is investing in themselves. And because they've brought that skin to the game, it's what makes them such a great partner in this process because you know that they are in it and they're not expecting you to do the entire thing. So they're bringing their portion, investing in their community, and that gives us the confidence to bring that private equity and sort of finish the last mile. Thank you. Um, yep, please, Sorry. go ahead. So on your private partnership, does it allow, if, if the, the private part, of, no, the public part of it fails, does Brownville, Brownsville own the whole network then? Or how does, how does the, the out clause if, if the private partnership fails after 10 years and there's not enough money there, who, who owns that infrastructure when Brownsville only uh, owns 20% of it or whatever? So, you understand what I'm Yeah, well, there's a, there's a separation of the infrastructure, right? So, Brownsville okay. is, is putting money into their middle mile, right? And we, because, you know, because they're saying, hey, they're going to build that, we're going to then build to the residents at the at the other end of it, right? So okay. it, 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 it's not. I mean, there, the contingencies there, the way that the whole thing is structured, the the risk isn't there that the project's gonna. Yeah, you know, the the ownership is is clearly demarcated from the beginning, right? So we're we're investing in our infrastructure. They're investing in their infrastructure. It just it's a very uh, it's a very harmonious relationship that uh, you know. Then you can really look years down the road to say we're going to connect all of these, these residents and businesses through this partnership. And because we own the middle mile, uh, we also license it out. So that's a revenue. It, the, I mean, in projections are what, five years, I think. Uh, it's going to be something that's revenue producing for us because we're licensing it out. So uh, we get the benefit of that as well. So basically, the, the last mile is renting your middle mile to provide that service then. <clears throat> right, the, okay. the best example I use is we built the, the highway and they're building the off-ramps to get to your house. Sure, all right, thanks. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll open it to the floor now. Any questions? Um, there is a microphone circulating, and there is a question at the back. Why is the question always at the back and the microphone <laughs> always at the front? And will that be sold in a smart city? <laughs> Well, unfortunately, my question is, is way more focused and prescriptive, and I guess it'll go to Lexi, and I'd like for Mayor Men Mendez to, uh, to chime in as well. And, and the specific question is, relative to your specific business model, which is, I don't know, I'm looking for the word smartifying um, city infrastructure at a micro level, have you ever, and, and talking about public-private partnerships, et cetera, have you ever been approached, or have you ever approached, say, for example, American Tower or Crown Castle, the two large tower companies, about engaging and acquiring these assets from cities and then upgrading them for the purpose of enabling, you know, multiple private parties to work on, you know, on these streetlights? Because you know that's, it's, it's been a very successful model for them. And as you know, they, they lose money with the first carrier that's on the tower. They break even with the third. When they get that fourth and fifth, they print money. So it seems like that would be a very logical thing. I wonder if you would respond to that and have uh, the mayor you know, counter in terms of whether, uh, you know, what would be the issues relative to a city or municipality doing that? So, to answer your question, we, uh, we do get approached with those sorts of complicated P3 partnerships because we do offer the full solution, but we, we really pride ourselves on being able to provide that battery backup, right? So if we have a smart pole out there that is already installed in downtown, you know, Houston, and we want to make it energy efficient, say when a storm comes through, we have all of our critical assets still remaining alive and providing that redundant power, we can wrap Crown Castle poles um, which, you know, we are in conversations with partners like that all of the time. Um, and so we would negotiate with our, with our mayors that we're working with on how we make it a win-win for everybody um, and really have that energy savings component on top of what they're already providing to the city. The real question is, would, would a city relinquish that, that right that they have to those poles you know, in effect, selling that right in order to, you know, uh, enable your technology and solution? That's the question. Well, I've been seeing it the opposite way. So I've been seeing it in the utility space a ton. Um, whether it's a city or a utility, I'm finding that most do not want to deal with their streetlights. Um, it's kind of just an issue from maintenance um, onward. Um, and so, so yes, um, for, for the utilities, a lot of times the cities are buying back. Um, I know up in Buffalo, New York, um, National Grid, um, the, the city just bought back all of their lights um, from National Grid. And so the city is looking to make those sustainable smart poles as well. But then privatizing them, that's going, that's moving between <laughs> two public entities or pseudo public entities, however you want to look at a, a, a muni, a municipal utility, again, what about fully privatizing that infrastructure? Well, that's why it's great to sit at the table with these guys, right? <laughs> um, to have the conversations, the hard conversations, to see what they have in place and what they want. So, you know, if, if you, however you are handling your infrastructure, Clearworld would come in and our, our idea is to support whatever your goals are to get you to the finish line. Um, and so that's how we've always operated. So, Mayor? Would you sure, I think in the last 45 minutes I've learned that Lexi's an extremely worthy adversary, especially on the other side of a negotiating table. I so I look forward to that. Uh, but, but in all seriousness, I think um, this concept specifically, streetlights, and, and I said this earlier in a private conversation, I said streetlights is something that we really don't even think about. We prefer not to deal with uh, on the city side as a mayor, city manager. It costs us money. It's really hard to maintain and it doesn't uh, really help us run our city for the most part in any sort of efficient way. This uh, particular concept works and it checks all the boxes with, with one notable exception, I'll get to that, which is uh, we don't have to pay for the maintenance anymore. Uh, we can actually monetize it on the back end, potentially depending on what sort of monetization they can come up with. Um, 
although I think that, like, I think maybe what you were alluding to, I, I really personally don't have any issue with the privatization of this particular uh, street lights. I think it's a good thing for us. But, um, and I think it really depends on who, who it is you're talking to, what kind of vision they have or, or how they see it, right? But um, I think it would, pro it would be a lot better. I'd rather just turn it over to them completely. And this is me speaking, right? I'm one of seven. But I'd rather just turn it over to a company like this completely, have them take on all the expense of retrofitting, installing, et cetera, and not have to spend any city money. And I think that may be what you're getting to. I think it might be a better business model, maybe, depending on the cost, because you'd have to fund it and, and really get some startup capital. But if it was me, I would really consider taking it over, taking on the expense as a company, and getting a lot of the, the monetary benefit from it, and maybe reducing the percentage to a city. If a city's having to invest on the front end, it's a little bit harder if you didn't have that plan in your CIP. Uh, for example, uh, it's almost like an ESCO, uh, where they're telling you, hey, you're going to be spending a million dollars a year on energy. How about you spend 500000 a year instead of the million, and we're going to save you this amount of money, but there's going to be an infrastructure cost on the front end. So the ESCO-type model is a little bit harder to sell to a city because you may not have that, like I said, in your CIP, or you may not be planning to, uh, to change out these, uh, this particular equipment. Uh, we in Brownsville actually have a multi-year plan that we already funded to replace all of our street lights, so it's good timing if this were to happen in Brownsville. But yeah, I think it, it just depends on the company itself. Can it afford to, to front uh, all the money to replace all this and get, maybe get a larger piece of the pie at the back end? That's for the company to decide. Yep. Well, I, I, again, I mentioned the, the, the two uh, gorillas in that, in that particular space, American Tower and, uh, uh, and Crown Castle, as I think each probably own certainly in excess of 50,000 towers nationwide, if probably 100,000 towers each. I haven't gone and looked at the numbers lately, but I would really suggest both uh, the city of Brownsville and Clear World kind of look at that together because it may be a and they it may be an interesting three-way model to bring them in you you know you have the technology platform they can be the operator and uh and the city can be the beneficiary um, do we have any other questions questions we have a little time three minutes over here So, uh, Mayor Adler, and I really enjoyed the speech by Mayor Adler. I've been in Austin since all my adult life, when, back when uh, the Capitol was the tallest building. So, <laughs> it's been a while. And uh, one of the things that he mentioned and Mayor Mendez mentioned is the kind of trial and error of being a smart city. There's, there's going to be some failures, there's going to be some hits and misses, but, you know, you trend upwards and you grow. Um, and I've seen that with small cells. Google Fiber coming in, there was, you know, some rough spots in the beginning and things. Uh, I guess I'd like to learn a little bit about some lessons learned from kind of your, your trial and error. And, and I know Round Rock, you're, you know, Mayor Mendez and Round Rock, uh, Mr. Saad, you're probably right in the middle of some of this with, with some of this infrastructure stuff. So I'd like to hear a little bit about the, the trial and error. And also, um, as a follow-up to that, and this may be more in Mr. Saad's technical acumen is, uh, it seems like a lot of these infrastructure builds, do you have it in mind when you do this? Are you planning how that scales to meet the next needs? As you move electronics closer to the network edge and things like that, you know that IoT is going to change and, and smart cars and all these other things are going to come and be a part of your smart city. So I guess the follow-up is, in addition to lessons learned, are you looking ahead when you make these decisions and how are you doing that? Um. So on the technical side, I'll address that first because I think that more uh, is in, in my area that I'm dealing with on a daily basis. Um, so right now, you know, some of the examples that we've done uh, are our parking garages and smart parking. Um, you know, Mayor uh, mentioned that a lot of our small cities were trying to attract people to downtown, try to really help the businesses that uh, operate on a daily basis in our smaller downtown cores. So um, one of the things that we uh, tried 
was putting smart parking in a couple of our garages, and that's been a huge success. Um, so that's, that's systems that kind of tell you availability. We develop an app as well, so as people are coming in, here's where our parking is available, here's where um, it, it's taking. So every new garage that we're now putting in place, for instance, we're putting in smart parking. Kind of a neat example where we'd say we tried and that was a success and we're expanding on it. Um, uh, you know, another thing that we see is that uh, e-vehicles are becoming pervasive. So should we be offering charging stations as part of the municipal offering in these garages? And that probably is coming and we'll pilot that as well. Um, I think that's going to be coming out in the, in the next couple of years where um, we're trying to retrofit our garages so that we just offer free charging uh, and promote uh, electronic vehicles coming into our downtown core. From a, what's coming next, I think one of my initiatives, and it, it's interesting to me, um, you know, just kind of, I'm fairly new to the CIO role at, at the city of Round Rock, is transportation projects um, are massively expensive. Um, but we talk about, when, when we talk about smart cities, it's connectivity that really lays the groundwork for a smart city. And so what I'm trying to do is uh, get the right folks in the room to add to their transportation master plan conduit for every project that we do going forward from a transportation perspective to so that we have the, the, the paths that we can lay fiber down and have connectivity throughout our city because we know it's coming. IOT is coming. Uh, it's already here, uh, but it's only going to expand traffic cameras, control systems on your network. And if you can really lay down that foundational fiber grid um, as part of these transportation projects, I think that's a drop in the bu bucket for those projects. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Uh, next, something that I'm going to try to, to make our, our next move with. Thank you very much. Uh, we're out of time, so I'd like to ask the panel anything they would like to say. I don't want anybody to go away saying, I wish I had said or if I'd been asked. Um, which, uh, so anything that, that you would like to say on this subject, uh, we would love to hear. Now is your chance. I'll start. I think uh, Mayor Adler said it right, is, is um, the city has to take a risk, be willing to take risk, and it has to have the right culture. If you don't have the right culture, then you're not going to have smart city initiatives moving forward or anything like that. So, so kudos to, to Brownsville and other cities that have, have gone down that path that's, that has, have the um, council's vision of, of I'm risk of, I'm, I'm, I'm available to risk, I'm willing to take risk, and I'm willing to take the heat from citizens that, that don't appreciate failure. So kudos to those cities, so, so appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Sure, and I think being in, in government or being in bureaucracy, I think there's a certain part of that, historically, you're risk averse. But I think now in the world we're living in where there's so much technology, so much innovation, you can't really uh, get to where you want to go and be competitive if you don't take some risks. I just think you have to be really careful about vetting uh, whoever it is you're, you're going into a public-private partnership with or whoever it is that you're possibly providing incentives to or what it is that you're doing. But there's so much technology out there creating all sorts of wonderful uh, solutions for us in government and in cities that um, it's, you know, for me, it, it's really exciting to be mayor because I hear about all these ideas and, and get to hear all these solutions for problems that we have that we're now able to solve. Anybody else? Anybody want to say anything? I would like to say thank you to Digital 360 Summit for having us, um, Clear World, as a part of the CEDAR program. I'd also like to thank the 200 cities that we've worked with in the last 200 years for being those risk takers and getting us in there. Um, and yeah, it's been a great experience being able to see how renewable smart city infrastructure is, is really changing how communities operate. Well, I'd like to say I endorse everything Lexi said, and I'd like to thank the panel for being so interesting and for coming here today to share their wisdom with us. And thank yes. you, Levelin, for that. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. We have some time now.